soul, you worship his holy name, sing like never. song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise again. Lord, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here this morning. Thanks for coming out to be with us. If you are a guest, thank you for coming this morning. We're really honored by that. Um, you could be anywhere, and you're here, and we're grateful for that. There, uh, there may be something that is said or done today that you have questions about if you're a guest, and so we would love to sit down and, and uh, talk with you about what makes Twickenham so odd. Would be, and... and <laughs> And why you would fit perfectly, all right? Uh, there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place that in the collection plate later in the service. We're just really, really honored that you're here this morning. Hey, let me invite you to stand for a second, and I want to uh, share a reading with you uh, as we continue our worship. Uh, we're uh, continuing our series this morning in the book of Joshua. We'll be in chapter 6, but at the end of chapter 5, there's something really important that happens that sets the stage for chapter 6. And so it's a great way for us to begin our worship. It's uh, from chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Just hear the word of the Lord. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence, some versions say in worship, and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, 
Take off your sandals, for the place you were standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That question, what message does my Lord have for me? That is a really, really good question. I want to invite you just to take a moment to stand in silence before the Lord and contemplate that question as we enter into our worship this morning. What question does the holy God have for you? This is holy ground, we're standing on holy ground, for the Lord is present, and where He is, is holy, this is holy Love. 
streams and the rivers whisper the Savior's name. Awesome and holy, a friend to the lonely, forever his love will of God in this way in Revelation 4. And if you would join me when we get to the close of the passage. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have received. Alleluia. Alleluia, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Alleluia, Alleluia, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. You are holy, holy.
this morning, and we're going to continue to discuss and focus on the walls of Jericho in Joshua 6. And as I studied and read this story the last few days in preparation, the one thing that continued to jump off the page in this story was how unusual of a commandment God gave the Israelites. What a strange strategy. So God commanded them to walk around the wall once a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, blow through a ram's horn horn and scream to the top of their lungs, and the walls of Jericho are going to fall. It sounds like something that would happen in Twickenham Kids with my four-year-old girls class but they took the city of Jericho. And so as I I reflect on that this week, I begin to think about all of the unusual plans and methods and also unlikely people that God uses throughout the Bible and throughout history to fulfill his plan and deliver his message. And as you think about these, there are many. But my concern as I try to reflect and make it make sense in my life as I read the story about the walls of Jericho is I struggle with those things. So I don't automatically draw to the unusual and the unorthodox and those unlikely people. I like things to be logical. I like things to make sense. I like for them to be in order. Now, as I look around this room, people in this auditorium, I know that 30, 40, 50% of your engineers. So you think like that as well, maybe even more than me. So if God's going to continue to use unusual stories and unusual methods, you know, and like the walls of Jericho, possibly the most unusual strategy in military history to deliver his message or win a battle, then my concern is, do I see those opportunities around me? Because I'm not always drawn to those. I live in my box that has structure and is very sterile and has times and appointments and I don't always see the unusual. But as I think about this and, and trying to reflect and think about how can I see these opportunities, I'm reminded of a story that I heard about 10 to 12 years ago about a man named David Nasser. Some of you have probably heard of David Nasser. Maybe you've read one of his books. Um, Maybe you've heard him speak live. Uh, But David Nasser was born in Iran in 1970. So 1970s and 80s Iran, 
uh, was pretty bad before the revolution, even after the revolution. He was born into a, a military family that had a lot of prestige, very wealthy, had servants. But David's father knew that if he didn't get his family out of Iran, that one day they would all be murdered. Because that's, that's the way Iran was at the time. So he developed a really elaborate plan to get his family from Iran to America in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s. And very dangerous plan, but through the grace of God, somehow David Nasser's father delivered all of his family to America. Now David is a young teenager now, and he's lived all his life in Iran under the threat of not knowing if he's going to live from one day to the other, a terrible life. And now he is, he is in rural America, Colleen, Texas, and he is a teenage, middle school, Muslim Iranian who knows no English in Colleen, Texas. So he left one really terrible life and entered into one that was pretty bad also, but he began to become Americanized, and over time, he made friends, and at the age of 17, one of his friends asked him to go to, on a Saturday night, he said, hey, David, I want you to go to church with me, and he said, it's a Christian church, and David said, you know what, I would love to, but my father will never allow that to happen. You see, we're Muslim, and my dad's not going to allow me to go to a Christian church. He, he urged him, hey, hey, David, just go in and ask your dad. Let's go in your house tonight and let's ask your dad if you can go. So they went in. David's dad's already asleep in bed, but David went down the hall and shouted through, the, through his room of his door, hey, dad, I already know the answer, but can I go to church with my buddy? It's a Christian church tomorrow morning. And David's father didn't answer the way he thought he was going to. He said, what's the name of the church? And so David's friend shouted back the name of the church and there was a little pause, and David's father says, I know that church. Those are good people. Sure, you can go. David was amazed. What David didn't know at 17 years old is about a year prior to that, a group from this church had developed a relationship with David's father. See, David's father was a restaurant owner, a failing restaurant owner, barely keeping his doors open. And so the worship leader like our worship leader. He developed a group of people from that church to go begin helping this, let's think about it, Iranian Muslim restaurant owner in this small town keep his doors open. So they waited tables, they cooked, they bussed tables, they developed a relationship with David's father. They softened his heart. Now, they went into a mission field right there in their hometown. It didn't require a passport, didn't require a budget. It was just right there. And David got to go to church that next Sunday morning. So now, fast forward, David speaks, David Nasser speaks to 500,000 to a million people per year through concerts and camps and lectures. He has written several Christian books. He has taught hundreds of thousands about Christ. And all of that happened because a worship minister at this church decided to mission to Iranian Muslim restaurant owner in his small town, and he tore down that wall of Jericho. That was his wall of Jericho. Very unusual, but he saw it. And so I prayed this week as I'm getting ready for this that I can see those unusual, strange, crazy opportunities that I don't always see because that could be my wall of Jericho. That could be your wall of Jericho. Let's pray for the bread. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for our blessings, God. We know we're a blessed people here. We pray that you would help us to share those blessings with those around us, God. And, and we pray that you would, you would help us to have the ears and the eyes and the open heart to see those opportunities around us, those unusual, strange opportunities that we don't always see. God, we, we pray that we don't miss them. We pray that you can use us in those opportunities to further your kingdom. We pray, God, that you be with us as we share this bread. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before. God, again, we come to you thanking you for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us. God, we pray that you be with us as we share this cup. We pray, God, that, um, that we don't take it for granted. We know we did nothing to earn the sacrifice, sacrifice that was made for us, but we pray today as we share this cup, we reflect on our lives and and share this story with those around us this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before. Above all thrones, above all wonders.
rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Crucified, lay behind the stone. You lay. Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall. So you can uh, look in uh, Joshua chapter 6 as we begin this morning uh, with the time of teaching. Joshua chapter 6, that's the 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book in the New Old Testament. Fifth book in the Old Testament. Start in Genesis and go that way. Sixth? Six. Oh, yeah, Pentateuch, five. Sorry. It's got a table of contents, all right? Look it up. <laughs> or use your device. It never occurred to me how violent a lot of children's nursery rhymes are until we were visiting with our grandson earlier this year, he's two, uh, and we were searching for an age-appropriate video, and we stumbled across the familiar three blind mice. And that seemed safe, until I saw the video. There is so much wrong in that little song. First, there is a house infested with mice. All by itself, that's enough to make you want to move. In fact, I know men in this church who have dispatched mice in their homes and never told their wives because they like that house. And for a bump in your tithe, I will re reveal names. I'll tell names. <laughs> Ladies. So you got mice. Okay, second of all, these, are, these mice are chasing the lady. Three blind mice, see, they all ran after the farmer's wife, right? That's some aggressive mice right there. And then third, and the scariest part of all, the lady, the farmer's wife, is apparently very, very good with knives. <laughs> then I thought of other rhymes and lullabies. I want you to make a mental movie of this one, okay? Just close your eyes, I'm going to recite the lyrics, and I want you to make a movie in your head out of this nursery rhyme. Rock a bye, baby. In the treetop? When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the, when the bough, the limb breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come, baby. Cradle and all. In what universe is it okay to put a baby crib in the top of a tree? None. One more. And you, I can do this all day long because these things are horrible. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring. He went to bed and bumped his head and couldn't get up in the morning. It's a nursery rhyme about traumatic brain injury. That's what that one's about. <laughs> There's just more to these old nursery rhymes than we thought, and they are not sweet, and they are not as innocent as we imagined. And you know what? Uh, a lot of the Bible stories are that way too. This morning we're in Joshua chapters 5 and 6. The story of the walls of Jericho. In case you, you don't remember all the details, Kevin uh, covered that uh, just a second ago. It's not without dispute, but archaeologists believe the city was around 10 acres and surrounded by double walls. The outer wall was thought to be about 20 feet high, uh, the inner wall about 30. They were both to be about 12 feet thick, and you can already see the relevance of this story because what's in the news all the time the wall, the wall, the wall. And for people who had spent the previous four decades in a featureless wilderness, which is where the Israelites had been, Jericho, with its huge walls, would have loomed large and imposing. And rather than make a conventional military attack, God orders Joshua to have his armed men march around the city six days, led by a group of seven trumpet-blaring priests and the Ark of the Covenant, they do. And on the seventh day, they repeat this ritual siege, because that's what it was, kind of a ritual siege, but with two departures from what they had been doing. Rather than circling the city once, they march around it seven times. And then on the seventh march, they shout. And the walls collapsed. And Israel, Israel's army charged in and took the city. Now, that's how we remember the story. And that's as accurate as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. I want to show you two ways in which there is more to this story than you may have heard, more than you may have imagined, and more than you may like. First, it's not just a quaint children's Bible story. Rather, it raises some uncomfortable questions about us and especially about God. Because when we tell the story to children, where do we usually stop? The walls. 
collapse. That's where we stop the story, but that's, it's, a, it's appropriate, but that's not where the story ends. Look at Joshua chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord. Well, that sounds nice. We're going to devote the city to the Lord. What does that mean? It means that they destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. I told you when we first began this series in Joshua, faith for where we've never been, that we would face some vexing questions. Well, here we are. How could a loving, merciful God order the extermination of an entire city? I mean, we, we'd get it, I think, if there was no collateral damage, if the, if the only people who were killed in this battle were warriors, were, were, were soldiers of Jericho, Jericho's militia. But that's not how it went. Men, women, young, old, even the animals. It, you're thinking it, so I'll say it. This sounds more like jihad than Jesus. If this, if this story troubles you, and I've got to be honest, this troubles, this troubled me all week. Maybe it'll help to know that we're not the first to be bothered by it. In the second century A.D., this is in the 200s, a wealthy shipowner named Marcion, M-A-R-C-I-O-N, was disturbed by his reading of the Old Testament. And what he saw there was not the loving God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but a belligerent tribal deity that he called the Demiurge. Marcion rejected all of the Old Testament and parts of the New and preached that there were really two gods. There was, there was the God of Jesus, the one that you could love and respect and follow, and then there was this Old Testament God that was mean and petty and ruthless and capricious that you don't, you don't want to follow. Marcion was excommunicated from the church. They invited him to leave. And he had, he had made some very generous contributions to the church because he was wealthy, and the church reimbursed all of his contributions. Let me tell you something. When the church gives you back your money, you know you have done something. And so Marcion was gone. There are rumors that later in his life he came back around, but they're unsubstantiated. Now, there were others in the 4th and 12th centuries who had similar reservations. And you should not be surprised that there are what I would call neo-Marcionites writing books today. Our habit here at Twickenham is to not run from hard questions. And so I want us to lean into this one a little bit this morning. I, I will tell you the chances of you leaving with a lot of really good answers are not great. You may leave with more questions, but I think it's a good thing for us to have questions and struggle and wrestle. I want to make some observations, about four of them, about this issue of God ordering his people to totally annihilate the people of Jericho. And as we do this, it's really important for us to remember that God does not need for us to clean up his mess, okay? That's, our job is not to, to get God off the hook. It's God's job to clean up our mess to get us off the hook. So that's an important thing for us to remember as we go through this. So the first thing that I want to stress is that Joshua chapter 6, contra Marcion, and others that write about that today, in fact, the entire book of Joshua, is as much a part of the inspired, inerrant scriptures 
as any other book of the Bible. Now, we covered the idea of inerrancy and inspiration uh, some months ago, the beginning of the year, in a series called Text Message. It is written, but is it true? You can go back and pick up those online when we talked about that. The reason that I want to emphasize the inspired, inerrant nature of Joshua is that one way some folks these days try to deal with this uncomfortable question of how could a, a, a merciful, gracious, loving God give such a strange order it is to simply assert that this passage and others like it were the invention of people, not of God. That Joshua or whomever it was that wrote this needed to justify the genocide they'd committed and so they put words in God's mouth. That's what they say. That would mean that Moses or whoever wrote Deuteronomy did the same thing because in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God explicitly commands Israel to destroy all the people the Lord your God gives over to you. So denying the inspiration of Joshua may seem like a handy way to get God off the hook. But if we deny the divine origin of every passage that offends or troubles or challenges or unsettles us, then we're going to end up with a mighty slim Bible and anemic faith and a puny God. If we are never offended by something God says or does, then we are, we are probably not dealing with the one true God. We're talking about an idol that we have built out of our own imagination. If you're never offended by anything God says or does, if his commands never push against your life, if his values and priorities never put pressure on how you live and how you think, then the God you were worshiping is probably built out of your own imagination, a God made in our image who conforms to our standards, who reflects our values. There are going to be times when we come to the scripture and we read something and it is not going to feel comfortable. And when it doesn't feel comfortable, that's probably a good sign that the God we're experiencing here is the one true God. Second observation regarding this question is that this was neither the first nor the last time God exercised such fatal judgment. Earlier in the, the unfolding story of God's uh, work with the world, he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the biggest judgment event ever was that the one that, that's recounted in the book of Genesis when God wiped out all but eight people off the planet. The story of Noah and the great flood, another story that we kind of water down when we tell the children. In Luke 17, Jesus actually references both Sodom and Gomorrah and the great flood and appears not to have any problem with God exercising his judgment. Later on in history, God will use the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Romans to execute judgment on Israel because of their unfaithfulness, just as Israel in Joshua is bringing judgment on Jericho. And that's precisely what's going on here. Jericho, the, the, the entire Canaanite culture, was deeply, deeply evil. Jericho was not like a, a group of Baptists with whom we happened to have a few doctrinal disagreements. This was a violent, exploitative, brutal culture of people. One of their worship forms involved a furnace god named Moloch in which they sacrificed their own children. We're uncomfortable with God being a judge and executing justice. The Bible isn't, and Jesus was not. Third observation. Not everybody in Jericho died. Look at uh, chapter 6, verse 25. Really important verse here. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute. We talked about her a couple of weeks ago. Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her 
because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And from the writer's perspective, she lives among the Israelites to this day. Verse 23 mentions her father and her mother, her brothers, her sisters, and all who belonged to her. It is reasonable to infer that the phrase, all who belonged to her, included her own children or nieces and nephews. So even in the jaws of God's judgment, there is grace and mercy. And that raises a very interesting question. This may be the question God has for you today. Rahab was spared because she had hidden the spies that Joshua had sent. But what, why did she have the spies? It's worth going back to chapter 2 to find that answer. Listen to Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Here's what Rahab said. Here's why she hid the spies. This is ultimately why she is spared. I know this is Joshua 2, 9 through 11. I know the Lord has given you this land, she said to the spies, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in the country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you because the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. Rahab hid the spies because she recognized the God they worshiped was God in heaven and earth. Now here's the question. If the king of Jericho had made a similar confession, would he have been spared? If the entire city had acknowledged what Rahab the prostitute affirmed, would the entire city have been spared? We're not there yet in our journey through the Bible this year, but I look forward to reading the, the, the little four-chapter book of Jonah. I think we come on that in the month of May, middle of May, somewhere on the 15th or 16th. In some ways, it's a very similar story. God threatens to destroy the city of Nineveh because of its wickedness. With severe reluctance, Jonah goes and preaches to the people of Nineveh, and much to his surprise, they respond to the invitation. He doesn't even have to sing 50 verses of just as I am, and they all come forward. The king calls on everybody in the city to fast and to pray, and they do. So listen to what happens in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Here's a whole city that was full of violence and wickedness and brutality, and when confronted with the, with the Word of God, they repented and prayed and asked God to forgive them, and He did. It is reasonable to infer then that had Jericho responded to what it knew about God, as Rahab did, it too would have been spared. The opportunity to avoid God's judgment was available to the people of Jericho. They did not take it. Look, this isn't a popular thing to think about. It's not a fun thing to talk about. It's a thing that we're, you know, grace-oriented people don't want to go there. But there is a, an aspect of God's nature called judgment. And we will face that. And some of us live as if it's not going to ever be a problem for us. We are living as if it'll never happen. Over and over again in Scripture, that, that truth is taught, and that promise is made, and that story is enacted. But I just, I, I would not be a faithful minister of the Word if I did not point out that one of the stories, that one of the takeaways that we get from Joshua chapter 6 is that there will be a time of judgment and if you have not turned to the Lord, you will face eternity without the grace of Jesus. And I don't want you to do that. Maybe the message 
Remember that question we started with, what, what's God's message for you this morning? The very beginning of the service, what, what message does God have for you? Maybe that's the message he has for you. If there are some things you need to attend to in your spiritual life, I am begging you, I am urging you to attend to those. If there's something going on in your life right now, you know shouldn't be a part of your life. You know it's wrong. And if anybody else knew about it, they would know it's wrong. You don't need to be a Bible scholar to figure out that the, the, that the thing that's in your life right now doesn't belong there. Confront that. Seek God's grace and forgiveness and power. He will pour it out abundantly. He will give it to you. Don't go into tomorrow. Don't go into the rest of this day without confronting that. Believe me, I have gone through periods of my life where I lived with a sin I knew put me outside God's will, that is a terrible way to live. I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and go, I cannot believe I'm in this position. Don't live that way. Learn, lean on God, turn to God, and he can deliver you from it. All right, I'm going to go back to the notes here. Okay, are you okay with that? I know the slide guy up there is going, I don't know where he is. So I got one more observation about the, the question is, how could a loving and merciful God order the extermination of an entire city? For many of us, this question comes from a place of faith. When we ask the question, we're coming from a place of faith. We believe the Bible. We believe in God. We believe in God's goodness and God's justice and God's mercy and God's grace. When we ask the question, we're, we're just trying to square what we read in the text, of a place like Joshua, with what we know about God as we see him in Jesus Christ. We're just trying to understand. And then when it comes to stories like this, that's a really difficult thing to do. Logically, I can make sense of why it was necessary for God to issue such a command and how it is entirely consistent with his holiness. We've been singing about God's holiness, God's otherness, God's separateness all morning. Logically, I can poke holes in counter arguments all day long. But on a more visceral, emotional level, this story and others like it challenge my faith. They push against it. They create enormous discomfort. So if that's where you are, you're not alone. But when we confront that question, most of us in this room, maybe all of us in this room, are coming from a position of faith. But there are others who are in our world, in our culture, who are not trying to understand God. They're judging God. For example, in his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins called God arguably the most unpleasant character in all, and if you're listening to this uh, on a, uh, audio and not video, I'm putting up the quote signs. He said, arguably the most unpleasant picture in, uh, in a, a character in all fiction. If I can be perfectly direct... It takes a lot of chutzpah for someone in this culture or any other human culture to sit in judgment of God. In 2016, in the, in the United States, there were 660,000 abortions. One year, over a half a million. According to the World Health, World Health Organization, worldwide, there are 125,000 abortions every day. The World Health Organization estimates that one in three women worldwide have been victims of sexual or physical violence. I don't mean somebody made an inappropriate comment. I mean they were victims of physical or sexual violence. The Polaris Organization, which uh, fights human trafficking, reported uh, over 26,000 phone calls in 2016. That's one organization. That's just the calls they received. That's just in the United States. 26,000 phone calls to an organization that fights human sex and labor trafficking. One group, one organization. According to the National Children's Alliance, over 1,700 children died from abuse or neglect in the United States in 2016. 90% of those children were hurt or killed by parents or other relatives of the child. This story in Joshua is not a quaint children's story. It raises some un uncomfortable questions.
questions about God, but it confronts us just as directly. God in his sovereignty and holiness, because he has been places we have not been. He knows things we do not know. He commanded Joshua to utterly destroy Jericho and its inhabitants. He issued that order for the purpose of preserving the faith of the nation through whom Jesus would come into the world. Human beings have done far worse to each other for far lesser reasons. Now, I told you there were two ways in which this passage was not quite what we expected. More to this story than we thought. Here's the second one. It doesn't teach that God will remove all barriers to your prosperity. It teaches that God will remove all barriers to his purposes. And the reason I wanted to, to, to bring that into this message before we close here is this. Joshua 6 has been the happy hunting ground for prosperity preachers for decades. The walls of Jericho, they told us, represent all that stands between you and your land of milk and honey. John the Baptist, a disciple named Stephen, um, the Apostle Paul, John the Apostle, Peter the Apostle, and a host of others who endured hardship, prison, persecution, martyrdom, would strongly object to that application of this scripture. Our physical, your physical, material prosperity, mine, is not always as high a priority for God as it, as it is for us. God's priority purpose is and always has been his mission to rescue us from sin and death. He did that through Jesus in a way that was even stranger and more unorthodox than the Jericho march. On the cross, Jesus conquered sin. By walking out of the tomb, he conquered death. He destroyed the power of sin by dying. He killed the power of death by living again. God was working out that purpose when he ordered Joshua to take Jericho. In fact, one of the survivors of the city, the prostitute Rahab, became a part of salvation history. She married an Israelite of the tribe of Judah, a man named Solomon. They had a son named Boaz. Boaz married a woman from Moab named Ruth. They had a son named Obed. Obed and his wife had a son named Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David from whose royal line Jesus came. We may not always understand God's ways. That's why we need a faith for where we've never been. We will certainly not always be comfortable with his commandments. But God has been working to create a way for you and me to be welcomed into his family for a long, long, long time. John Perry is one of our elders. He's going to come lead us in a prayer. We'll have some announcements after that. John, come on up. If you need to talk this morning about something going on in your life, if you want to explore baptism as an option uh, that you haven't taken yet, it's a commandment in Scripture. If it's not a part of your life, it needs to be a part of your life. Jesus was baptized, as he said, to fulfill all righteousness. If you need to talk with somebody about a struggle you're having with sin, and you want to deal with it. I don't want you to leave this morning without an opportunity to do that. So I'm, I'm going to be over in here. I'm going to ask a couple of our elders to join me over in our coffee area. If you need to talk this morning, somebody will be there. And after service, we can talk in, in private and hear what you have to say. We'll pray with you. We'll do anything we can to help you. John, why don't you lead us in a prayer, and then I'll have a couple of announcements to make. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, you, you alone are holy. You alone are sovereign. And Father, your, your sense of order is so far superior to ours. And Father, at this moment, we, we humble ourselves, we submit ourselves, we bow before you, knowing that you are the great I am. You are the creator and provider of all things, and we are not. So as we submit ourselves to you, Father, we, 
We confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, our Savior. And we ask that you fill us with your spirit. You move us in your ways. You help us, help us to see your plan. Help us to see your sovereignty, your sense of order. Father, we, we know that we are sinful. We know that you've had a plan for us since the beginning and we've rebelled every step of the way. But you love us enough that you extended relationship with us through Jesus. And I pray that hearts will be moved to reach out and to accept that relationship, to, to follow you in obedience. Thank you for loving us beyond anything we can understand or imagine. And Father, our prayer is that your kingdom will come quickly and that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, John. A couple of quick announcements, family news here real quick. Uh, parents of teens, there is a meeting next week, a parent meeting next week. It's in the bulletin. You want to check that. Several announcements about upcoming showers in the bulletin. Follow take a look at those as well. And I do want to point out that Huntsville Inner City Learning Center uh, is going to be having their Backtrack 2018, the Give It Backtrack 5K. Uh, you can be uh, training for that. Uh, you have until May 12th at 8 a.m. Uh, there's an article in the bulletin about that as well. We appreciate Art and his work there. Uh, coming up real soon, uh, we have Secret Church, and we've got a video about that. Give your attention to the screens, and then I'll give us a close here in just a second. Okay. Um, why Secret Church? Whenever we think of church in America, we most often think of going to meet at a building, singing, praying, hearing a message from a pastor. But in many places around the world, church meets in a home or an apartment, sometimes even in secret. And many times there are just a few believers in that area who know and follow Christ. They face all kinds of challenges and difficulties in meeting together. Some places may even dangerous. So when they come together, they want to make the most of their time in a way that maybe is different than what you and I are often used to. Yeah. Secret Church is our version of a gathering then where we meet for an intense time of Bible study. Prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world who are facing persecution. Secret Church is not for the uncommitted or the faint at heart, but if you want to know God more deeply through His Word and know His church more fully around the world, then Secret Church is designed for you. It's not just to come and learn for one night and kind of have an event, but the goal is to pray together, to study the Word together, and then to use what we've learned during that gathering to make disciples of Jesus more faithfully right where we live and then wherever God may lead us around the world, maybe even to places where it's difficult and dangerous to share the gospel. So that's April 20th. We'll have it here at the building. It starts at 6 p.m. and goes to midnight. April 20th, 6 p.m. to midnight here at the building. Can I ask you to stand, please? I want to send you out with a blessing this morning from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go share that blessing with people you meet this week. Have a great week.